All right. Hey. So we're here we go. Let's have a little chat about the battle for Normandy and uh, get a kind of a, a baseline on my gameplay impressions. Keep in mind that we recently played the Omaha landings. We have played uh, the Epson battle and I think I played a couple of years ago on an enlarged map with a buddy, uh, with Jesse. I played the uh, the British landings or the that that section of the of the game as well. So I've got a little bit of experience here, but not a lot. I'm certainly not a deep, rich gameplay experience, but I do feel like I want to share some observations and run through our little little list of ten things to to cover off on, and a couple of. Interesting little nuances with this system that you probably don't appreciate until you get into the game and start playing a little bit. But it's got uh, there's a there's a lot of stuff in the rule book, and in particularly in the expansion, I would probably suggest that if you if you're going to purchase this game out of print copy or whatever the case may be, that you grab the expansion rules and buy the expansion and get the extra counters and maps. Not necessarily for the scenarios that are in that, they're, they're probably awesome, but uh, there's some updates to the OB, there's some uh, expansions on the rules for replacements, clarifications, there's some additional stuff that make the game, I think, a little richer, a little more nuanced perhaps than the the, the base version of the game. Uh, <clears throat> now, does it add a little bit uh, extra work? Yeah, it does, right? So so when you start doing breakdowns, you're doing breakdowns for paratroops and you're keeping track of paratroop losses and there are breakdowns for uh, armor and different types and different types of replacement points you've got to put together to work out what you get. So, but anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves here a little bit. So when I do these after action reports, I do typically talk about the decision space. And with this one, it's in a unique kind of, uh, you know what, let's swap. Let's swap so you can uh, look at the, the game instead of me and maybe we'll show some examples. Um, maybe I can't do that. Maybe I'll have to pause and come back. Well, clearly the Samsung video software is not sophisticated enough to switch from between one camera and another. <clears throat> or indeed run both of them at the same time, which used to be a very cool feature. All right, so we we're going to talk about the decision space in Battle for Normandy. And, you know, the, clearly here you, you have one, one team that is on the defense most of the time, but with uh, an awesome amount of punch and firepower and capability to counterattack if they can marshal their forces and get them into a situation where they're able to do something effective. All of my counterattacks have been particularly piecemeal and nothing really comprehensively effective. <laughs> Uh, and on the offense for the Allies, I really have been highly opportunistic looking for victory point locations and looking for the, uh, you know, the edge cases where, you know, we, we want to pick on uh, this corner here and try and get rid of these guys so that we can get rid of these guys or, or try and get around so we can get behind them and force them to retreat because it's gonna put them into some sort of supply conundrum. So from a decision-making exercise, you're dealing with brigades and regiments of units, and you're focusing on the tactical operations uh, in a detail level. Operationally, <coughs> you've gotta make sure that you've got your headquarters in the right location, so they're within X movement points of a given unit, and that you, uh, you are also allowed to attach certain core assets to a particular division and they can be used in that turn. So you've got some uh, core artillery here that we attach to this division here and they, uh, it was used in, the, in this day, this AM turn to uh, support these guys and it can't really be used by any of the other British divisions, although there's only one division here, but that's that's kind of the, the meat and potatoes of that type of thing. So, so it's sort of high level planning. You know, you could be putting divisional divisional operational lines down here. I find in this sort of situation when I'm playing solo that it becomes very very fluid, and and the the boundaries move because. Uh, 
you know, sometimes your objective is not achievable, so you want to adjust on the fly and your enemy, your opponent is doing something different, which is yourself. So there's, there's that going on. Uh, and really, but it does it step you up a level uh, and let you be the over, overlord commander, right? Uh, uh, for the operation. And it is also, though, allowing you at a divisional scale to work out how you're going to manage your assets and deploy them. So pretty interesting. It's probably, uh, I'm trying to think of something it would be akin to, you know, it's at the same, um, it's just at a more detailed level than, say, your, your, you know, your Normandy 44 or Arden 44, because you've got all these breakdowns for all these divisions. And the scale is obviously different because it's, three three turns per day an a.m a p.m and a night turn um, you have almost a hundred percent visibility into uh, the data on the board so you're not really uh, there are very few unknowns now you're not allowed to inspect stacks until you actually uh, commit to the attack uh, so there is some of that subterfuge going on and i'm guessing you could hide your hqs if you wanted to I could put this under a flak unit, but it's pretty obvious that, you know, this HQ is going to be within X hexes uh, of the units, X hexes or X movement points. So we're just going to, we're going to be working off this sort of metric. We know that either six movement points or six hexes, uh, that the, the HQs are going to be somewhere in range as the case may be. Right. So uh, let's see what else. Objectives, objectives. Uh, this is, was in, interesting uh, to look at the victory point schedule here. It's graded out by day, so we're trying to map to historical objectives, I imagine. And clearly, if you can uh, capture Khan early, you are going to gather up a significant number of victory points uh, very, very quickly. And that is going to throw you over the over the line to have a win much earlier than later as the case as the case may be i'm just trying to find the the vcs in here for you it should be right here somewhere i think or not and i'll, t I'll tell you about that in a second uh, can i find it battle for normandy all the optional rules it might be actually you know what it's in the rule, main rule book I did find that I spent a fair amount of time flipping around in the rule book because things weren't always where I thought they might be. Uh, and this is a classic example where I could probably look at, uh, at the, at the uh, chart and kind of go at it from there or find the chart. And let me do that. All right, I found them. It's in the individual scenarios. So what I was uh, trying to say was on the back of the scenario book is a, is a, whoops, is a set of uh, victory points and uh, locations of, of those victory points and the uh, dates that they apply. And then we can look inside the rule book, inside the scenario booklet and see the, the dates here. So a win, uh, assuming you stopped on play on the 9th of June, you would need five VPs. Sudden death would be eight, 15th, uh, nine and 13, for instance. And so you, we, we've already exceeded that, uh, 13 VP point, uh, because of the, the way things worked out with Khan and the, some of the mistakes I made as the Germans. Uh, and we picked up some other, other points over the map. And so we're in excess of that 15 sudden death number. It's by the by. The point of that is that from a player, a player objective standpoint, it's very clear what you need to do. And it does drive you to attempt to make progress against, against a timeline because you, you either, and not because you're wanting to overachieve or, or do better than the, as the Germans or better as the, the allies. But there seems to be, you kind of feel this, this pressure when you see a victory point location go from four to three to zero. You're like, wow, I, I kind of need to get on that and, uh, and get after it. So that tends to kind of uh, push you along. Uh, I, so, so that's interesting. Uh, as far as the next factor would be the order of a bat battle and the granularity there, 
Uh, unfortunately, I'm not an, uh, an expert in the order of battle that's presented here uh, for this particular operation. I've heard complaints about the British Airborne being inaccurate, uh, but I can neither confirm nor deny, deny those uh, factors. I will say that there are a significant number uh, and wide variety of units, although <clears throat> because this is a, it's, is a monster game, right? We're talking about, even if we don't include the expansion, it's a three map game with a heavy number of units on the map. Because it's a large, a large-ish game, <clears throat> I think that the gameplay has, has been, it's been decided that the gameplay should be smooth and relatively fast. And I think it achieves that objective, that objective. So while there's differentiation in the, uh, capabilities of the different units. There are crocodile units that uh, give you the DRM. There's air, an abstracted air. Uh, armor gets to move twice in a turn. So it's got double the movement rate of the foot sloggers. Uh, there's uh, armor DR. There's benefits for being com in combined arms if you're using some of the optional rules. So there's, and there's lots of other little DRMs that are not overwhelming, but there's enough there to give it some flavor, but it's certainly not any, you know, grand operational uh, simulation, uh, like the goth, it's not the goth system with, with the landings and the, uh, the fine tuned, very, very granular, uh, detail. So this is more, I would call this a playable monster where if you wanted to get a feel for the scope, of the operation and wanted to understand some of some of the mechanics and the tactics that were involved and how the terrain played uh, into this you know the bocage and the the farmland and the cities uh, the beaches if you want to get a feel for it there i think it does a very very good at being representative of what i've read about the, the Normandy landings and Operation Overlord. So I think it's, it does a, a pretty good job of bringing that flavor to the table in a monster game format without bogging you down in a lot of fractional math, a lot of uh, excessive die rolling, uh, too many, there are, you know, you know, too many DRMs or anything of that nature. So the CRT, and this is just my copy, I, I make photocopies of a lot of stuff, but uh, it's a straightforward CRT. There's no, there's no DRMs listed here, but, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here they are here. So there's obviously terrain and a handful of others for night and uh, other bits and pieces. And then there's optionals that are not included here. So, <clears throat> so I think it, I think it does that pretty well when it comes when, when we're talking about uh, playability and, and the granularity of the of the OB. The, the reason why granularity is important is because you may have specific and special units, and that's re that's really only played out here in the combat factors and defensive factors of these particular of these particular units. That's where the majority of the granularity or the differentiation will, will come from. So I know that some people get a little frustrated with the standard combat system because it is standard and it is very generic. And a, a flak unit is no different from an army unit, is no different from an infantry unit, other than one of them is armor and maybe got to move twice or overrun and move or whatever the case may be. It's a extremely generic game and it has very generic uh, rules and there's very little by way of special rules to, to add flavor to ma the majority of those modules. I find the monster games on the SCS systems to be far less fun than perhaps this is. So if I, if I were to play Day of Days, I would probably be playing faster than I'm playing here, potentially, but uh, yeah, I don't think you're going to get as much flavor out of the game just because of the peculiarities of the SES system. Whereas here with Battle for Normandy, you uh, have relatively fast play. So you, you can finish your AM, you can finish one cycle for one side 
30, 40 minutes or 45 minutes. It's pretty quick across all these counters. That's a lot. Now, there's some more thinking that needs to go into things if you uh, are adjusting your plans all the time. The Germans probably have to think a little harder and a little longer about where they're going to move to because uh, there's some places it's, it's tricky to, to disengage. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, so, so I'm happy with the OB here. I'm also really happy with the gameplay, right? So I think that that kind of covers off on the conflict uh, combat resolution as well. Uh, the, it's, it's got enough in it. There's enough uh, you know artillery being brought to the table. Uh, there's enough air uh, flavor coming in there's enough uh, there's enough differentiation in the gameplay so i think that's kind of nifty there logistically things are pretty straightforward i, I think i showed you that little chart earlier on as long as your hq was was within six movement points or six hexes of the rest of your division and, and there's a little caveat with uh, if some guys are out of supply as long as they're within three hexes of someone else who's in who's in supply they're probably okay uh, and then you track from the HQ, you track, you track back 20 MP to a source, and that's pretty much it. Uh, you don't have to fuss too much about it. And as I'm looking here, I'm seeing that, uh, it's just gonna bother me because it's sitting out like a sore thumb. I didn't move my HQ last turn before, I, before we uh, got into the combat phase. And so, you know, most of these guys would have been out of supply. So that would have been a bad thing, right? So we would have moved him up to here somewhere. One, two, three, four, five, six, yes, see, so he would fit exactly up to here, for instance, right? And that would put all these guys into supply. Uh, the, the, we won't go into the penalties for being out of supply because A, I don't recall them, and B, it has not happened uh, other than one time we got a German unit out of supply, so I haven't really paid too much attention to that. Uh, the historical narrative is an interesting thing to talk about because you obviously have the landings and there's a lot of structure in the landings and a completely sort of different uh, combat resolution exercise going on with the landings that just gives us enough flavor and enough uh, insight. Well, probably not insight. I don't know that you get insight. It gives you enough flavor to experience the landings and get the guys out of the beach, and then you, you then you kind of flip over to the regular combat mode of, of doing things. Uh, there's lots of strong points there, and those strong points have to be reduced or eliminated versus having you know actual units on the map that you're, you're trying to reduce or eliminate. So I think that all worked pretty well, and it was one of the least painful landing exercises I've gone through when I did the Omaha scenario. So pretty happy, I'm pretty happy with that. All right. Uh, the general narrative is pretty strong, I, but no, I shouldn't say that actually, because I, I don't know that it is very strong. Hang on one second, I need to drink water. The narrative comes out, but it's not particularly emotive. I, you're, you're seeing the story of the landings, but I'm, I'm finding I'm not particularly attached to anybody or any units, and uh, I'm just going for I'm going for hexes, and particularly over here in Khan, I, you know, I was looking at some of the odds that I was potentially going to get here, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, you know what, a two to one attack or a three to one attack with a minus three for being in a city because that's got infantry in the hex, and this one would be a minus two because there's just armor in that hex. That's going to be pretty rough, and these guys are going to take a loss. Oh well, and you know, you just kind of do the attack. Whereas if I compare that to some other systems I've played. You're like, mm, man, those guys are going to get slaughtered here. There's got to be another way for me to get around or, or do something different. And I've found that this, this game does invite you to the slugfest. I will give it that. Uh, so that is a narrative in of its own self. And there's also an interesting thing here. When you start digging into the game system and the rules and how things work. Let me zoom in here a little bit. We can do that without uh, it getting wonky. When we zoom in here, the British have ended up adjacent to all of these guys in farmland uh, for, the, for the end of their AM turn. This means that these guys either need to stay in this hex and fight or move back because some hexes clear uh, and farmland in particular, and there's one other, other that I don't recall, you have to, if you're in a zone of control, 
you will have to engage. Now, you can use an artillery unit to satisfy that engagement. So I could just bombard those guys and uh, do that exercise and that would fulfill that obligation. But I clearly, I don't have one, two, three, four, five uh, arty units available. And that's not a good use of my arty, by the way. So I would need to, I'm going to need, for instance here, I'm gonna to need to pull back a hex, right? So there's part of the subtlety in the system that you don't really appreciate in from the get-go. Plus, it's two movement points extra to leave that hex unless I leave a unit behind as kind of like a covering force to get out of there. So if I broke down one of these guys into a company level unit, I could do that. And then, uh, so that's four to get to there. Now I only have two movement, well this has, this has eight movement points, but a, a, a normal unit has six movement points. So I only have uh, two movement points left so I can move along the rail line, I can get onto this road or I can go to here. And with the stacking point restrictions, the, the white number in the black circle, you can only have six points in any hex. So that is going to force you to make some, some hard choices. And it's also a way to get your enemy to move away or move back. On the, con on the flip side for the Germans, it's also a way for the Germans to force the, force the Americans or the uh, allies into an attack situation that probably isn't, maybe is not advantageous to them. So that's interesting as well. So you can push up a couple of strong units and put them up against a couple of other units that perhaps don't have the right capabilities or the right strength level. And you know that it's gonna be a low odds attack. They're probably likely to either have to retreat or take a step loss and you might get off scot-free. So the system builds that in and gives you uh, some interesting tactical choices that get to be made because of that. It's almost encouraging you to, to stay, stay snug to your enemy uh, uh, and force them to retreat. And then as they retreat, then you wanna get up, back up and get snug up against them again. So that's a pretty interesting little mechanic. It's pretty common as well. I mean, it, I've seen it in lots of different games where, you, you know, if you're adjacent, you've got to attack. But this is a, a little uh, differentiated here in that it's by particular types of terrain. So I liked that. And there's some other things like that in this game that you, as you start playing and thinking about how the rules work together, you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, I see how that can be used to my advantage or to the enemy's disadvantage. Replayability. This, uh, lots of gameplay here, but this is a son of a bitch to set up. There's a lot of stuff going on and everything has a uh, turn of entry uh, markers on it. So it is relatively easy, but you know, you've got that nine there on the right hand side. That's the turn that guy arrives. You want to have some pretty fine organizational skills when it comes to putting this away. And in fact, the person that I purchased this off has got, the, has got it set up by turn order by beach. And that is how everything is set up, is, is structured. Obviously not for the Germans, it's just by, by turn order for the Germans. So a lot of work there to get set up. Ultimately, pretty satisfying exercise. And I would say that there's a significant amount of replay value. I've heard some folks say that there's nothing, uh, there's no need to have the expansion. I would disagree heartily with that. Uh, it, first of all, you can see that by June 10th, even with, uh, even with the poor play by the German uh, player myself, we are, we are uh, you know, probably on the cusp of having to pull back out of Khan, or at least maybe along this river line here and obviously trying to stop this, this penetration that's going on over here on the right hand side. But I've still, got, I've still got all of this terrain here to protect and defend. And uh, similarly, you know, underneath that pile of crap there, all the different uh, copies of rule books and stuff, uh, there's more gameplay to be had here. There's the St. Low map area. That's the next big hub that once, once these guys clear all this area here, they're gonna be heading towards 17th SS. And of course, Carantan is over there and, and nothing has really happened there very much because the airborne have kind of hit a snag. So lots of gameplay from that perspective. And I think there's a lot of interesting tactical bits and pieces that would go on down here. 
Uh, but we're probably not going to get to that uh, given given where we're at uh, with with the game. So, all right. So that was a replay play time. I think I said forty five minutes per sides AM or PM turn. Could stretch out to over an hour if you're going to be uh, that guy. But uh, if you want to just play, move, and I, I play by sections of map, so I will do all my movement here, do all of the combat here, and then I will move to this section, and then I'll get over to the Sherbrooke section and do that. And in fact, here I did, uh, except this is the one bit where I did uh, these two pieces together here, and then I did all of this over here, just to make life a little easier for myself. Uh, I think the, the maps are beautiful. The counter uh, counters are, are nice. They're a little slippery for my liking. They're good thickness. Uh, they are, the charts are pretty well organized. You know, everything is on two, two pieces of paper, that's it. And you've got a terrain chart. And then uh, I printed off these, these supply things that are in the back of the rule book. So you've got that. The maps, I think, are pretty striking, uh, frankly. I, I, I like them uh, a lot. The rule book, you know, the rule books are good, and, and I think that the the latest edition from the expansion has a lot more uh, detail in it, and some designer, more designer notes spread out, and some errata put put in there, and lots and lots of little expansions. Uh, so that you know when you're using up your combat supply so there's one thing to be in supply in this game but you also as the allies you've got to spend supply points which you receive back at return for for attacks and depending on the size and scale of the attack you're going to pay more for it uh, in this in, with one of the optional rules so that is also uh, a pretty neat part of the supply system that I forgot to mention earlier mention earlier on now coming back to the supplies, to the rule book, the rule book is very well laid out. I just found it, uh, I don't know if it's a lack of consistency, but I just found, I spent quite a bit of time in the rule book looking for things. But other than that, I would say in general, it, it reads well and is understandable. And this is a, as I said, I would call this, you know, the players, the players, uh, highly playable monster game. So it's super expensive at the moment. It's out of print. There's a new module coming out sometime in the future uh, for Sicily. We can hope that uh, Danny Holt will uh, get around to finishing that off and maybe uh, GMT will put that back on the, on the P500. But nevertheless, pretty fascinating game. Uh, I think it's uh, it's got a lot of a lot of replay value, and I quite enjoyed it. And uh, I think that playing it opposed with uh, maybe you know four folks would be would be pretty good fun. Uh, I think you get it done in a couple of days, particularly if you start it from seven the seventh of June in the PM turn and skipped all the landing stuff, and then just got after it from there. All right, gonna let you go. That's uh, probably more than you need to to hear. But all the best. Cheers. Welcome back to the big board. Battle for Normandy. 10th of June, AM turn, end of the AM turn for the Allies. And I thought we would just run across the board and have a quick look, uh, just to be a brief update, and show you some of the key movements and activities of the forces. So, <laughs> besides dropping my pen and bumping all these pieces here, we can put them back. Great start. All right, excellent. I've had some issues with the maps, uh, just in terms of uh, the shifting underneath. I don't know why. I think I, maybe I was a little too quick to, write, to setting this up. So uh, I've had some shifts, which have just been frustrating. But other than that, <laughs> the maps are great. So I've taken uh, elements of a couple of different formations and started pushing them up into this area as the Germans pull back because the Germans found this section here to be untenable in terms of defensive terrain and uh, modifiers and things of that nature. And the fact that I didn't have enough units to cover that area and keep forces inside uh, Khan over there. So the, uh, uh, the British here have taken advantage of that and attacked pretty aggressively, uh, knocked off, uh, there was uh, two units here, they knocked off a step and uh, 
you know, secondary attack in the mobile phase, on the mech phase, they uh, finished the, the stack off with armor. And now we see we're sort of hunkered down around the Lear units here. These guys took a step loss as well in Cagney here. Uh, no attacks on this side of Khan at all uh, at the moment. Just don't have the strength here. Uh, I had a question as to whether I should have brought 51st up through this way and put more pressure on <coughs> these forces here or reinforced the the um the guys that were over here the canadians and there's another there's another british division over here as well i just can't seem to see the number right now but trust me there's one here and what we've done over here is just made uh heavy attacks in here uh inflicting a step loss and a step loss these are these are quite hefty armored units and and infantry units stacked together and we've literally been doing two to one or three to one attacks with four units attacking here, for instance, and uh, using the heavy bombardments for, from the shore, uh, onshore batteries, onshore, offshore batteries, I should say, from the Navy. And then lots of air applied here as well to negate the DRMs for the city. Similarly, here, this attack here went in as well, and then we attacked on over on this side of the map, just here on this edge, knocked out a unit here, and we're across the river just barely, only just staying in command. We're going to have to move uh, the HQs up to keep these uh, independent units attached to somebody and uh, keep them in supply. So that's what's going on over here. Now, interestingly enough, with 12th Panzer, 12th SS arrival here, Germans started out pretty aggressively and were able to sort of push things back and they actually recaptured Bayou for uh, almost all of Bayou for part of, uh, part of a turn, but were subsequently bounced back out as the threat of the Americans coming from Omaha, combining with some of these forces here, really just made it untenable and so once again they're starting to see these we did a whole bunch of attacks along here used a lot of supply this turn to really press back pretty heavily uh, over in the omaha area uh, further inland and you can see in here where the maps are misaligned uh we we are pressing in deep here there's just a small handful of units blocking the way but 17th SS is just uh, sitting over to the left of the screen here, waiting for uh, the opportune time, really looking to be more in defensive mode more than anything, uh, trying to slow the, the advance of the, the Americans who have now got uh, one or two divisions on the second armored is on the board and the 29th is over here. The first is doing all the heavy lifting over here. Uh, slow going over on this side. I just got to uh, this section here on the 10th, so they're well behind the historical over on this side, but just didn't have the, the punching power, mainly because I made a couple of mistakes with the landing. So see that, that marker there is the beachhead marker. And what I had done, I put... I was only bringing in one lot of units when actually I can go one, two three on each of those beach hexes. So I could th land three stacks a turn, not one stack a turn. So we've pushed everybody onto the the map and, and where it made sense, given them an extra move. But basically we're, we're probably two turns behind on Omaha Beach and similar thing over here on, uh, on Utah. Things have gone a little more slowly than I probably would have liked. And we've got a bit of a sticky situation with the two airborne divisions all brigades really, uh, really struggling, really struggling to uh, hold their own against uh, the Falschermjäger here on the bottom of the screen. And then top left, there's two divisions, although they're weak, <coughs> uh, pressing against the airborne. While in the distance, and we'll move the camera now. So in the distance right here, so here, hopefully you can see that, uh, we've got 90th and 
fourth division fighting the 709th here and the, some of the elements of the 91st over here and we're just trying to uh, trying to grind our way out on on, uh, on this location once I can take this town then things will pick up a little bit but all this is bocage and they have different advance after combat rules uh, for the bocage so still haven't got anywhere near Valange over here and uh, Cherbourg is uh, obviously off in the distance uh, over here. So still a lot of work to do. Now I will say that we're currently in a situation where the Americans and the, or the allies have actually achieved uh, the equivalent of an automatic victory on the 9th. And we're just playing now just a couple extra turns to see what happens and what transpires because there are a lot more forces coming onto the board. And, and I think mainly uh, it was misplay on my behalf of the Germans that allowed the, the, the a couple of hexes of Khan to be taken early. So we've kind of achieved the objective of, of getting a deeper, richer feel for Battle for Normandy. Probably not going to play too much more of it. I think there's some other stuff I'd like to get onto the table now while we're in this uh, sort of uh, uh, you know, stay in place mode uh, for the next week or so. So let's let's uh, keep going here. I'm going to wrap up this to turn, play uh, the German AM turn, finish up the tenth, and then we'll we'll have a chat about what we do next and whether you guys are interested in seeing more gameplay of this or whether we should uh, uh, pick up uh, something uh, something else or maybe a couple of different games. Let's see. Talk to you soon.